a hit. That's a hit. Hey, welcome back to the channel. If you've been following us for a while, you've uh, seen a lot of videos lately using flint locks, muzzle loaders, and I even wrote an article recently on my personal uh, transition and kind of journey towards uh, rediscovering the roots of the American rifle and shooting black powder, uh, specifically traditional muzzle loaders. Uh, I was exposed to it as a kid. I grew up with uh, my dad having a accurate Hawk and rifle replica that I would shoot and every time I shot black powder there was an allure and almost a calling to, to do it, to rediscover it and to pursue it and I always kind of just pushed it away. In the last year, um, last spring specifically, I shot some flint locks and that kind of changed everything. So over the last year I've been slowly positioning myself in getting ready to fully enjoy uh, owning a muzzle loader and owning a flint lock. So I spent uh, the last year compiling a small list of uh, accoutrements and things that I might need. So what I figured we'd do today is just go over some of this, some of these goods here and, and share with you some of the gear, where I got it, and uh, why perhaps I, uh, I went with the particular pieces that I have got. So you see here on my list, I came up with, uh, at the time, I wrote down a lot of different things, powder measure, cleaning kit, worm, rod. A short starter, funnel, mink oil, all kinds of things. A lot of these things aren't pictured here, but they're in a, an ammo can I got for uh, for cleaning my black powder, my muzzle loader. We'll start with the powder horn. There's two here. Uh, this one I actually found on eBay. However, it's made, I believe, in Pennsylvania. They're made in the United States, uh, the company that came out with these. And uh, this isn't the strap that came with it, nor the finial. However, it uh, it's a beautiful horn. It had like an antique finish on it very traditional in its in its appearance had the acorn so it's more of like an east coast hunter horn now i'm no expert on you know the, the absolute period correctness of a lot of this uh, equipment and i'm learning as i go but uh, this was a it was a nice horn it was a nice price i believe i spent like thirty dollars on it and uh i'm excited to use it for either my flintlock rifle i'm having uh, made custom made or if I get a fowler in the future, uh, I'd like to use this this particular horn with a fowling piece. But it's a nice horn. It's got a jute strap that I ended up getting off track of the wolf. And uh, there's an elk ivory tooth. I found this in an elk carcass one year up in the mountains. I use the elk ivory tooth here to kind of form a button, uh, which would shorten the length of my prime dispenser here in order to prime a pan. I can take the uh, the tooth, slip it out, and it makes it just a little bit longer if I want to have my prime dispenser that much longer on the cord here, or I can uh, shorten it up. Speaking of the prime dispenser, uh, this brass tube uh, dispenses about three grains of powder per push here into a pan, and that's a way to get uh, to to prime the pan of my flint lock without priming from a horn if I choose to do it the safest way possible. You'll see in a lot of the videos we do, a lot of the older gentlemen uh, choose to prime straight out of their horn and they'll shoot the same powder in their pan as they do in their main charge. Uh, a lot of them just run 3F powder in their horn for everything. And we're seeing that more and more. And again, I'm learning at this, I'm new, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do some 4F uh, prime in my pan and shoot either 2 or 3F uh, for my main charge and I'll just experiment with it and see which one I like which I prefer to do so that's that horn there I'll uh, show you the next horn because it's kind of interesting it's it's a uh, this is an actual Montana bison horn that I was able to fashion myself and that's one of the really cool things you'll find about this particular hobby is it kind of forces you to get crafty you end up having to do a lot of things yourself and it's not that you have to it's just it's enjoyable it's fun to you know, take on little projects, whether it's finishing knife handles, um, polishing some wood, stitching some leather, uh, making your own hunter pouch or possibles bag. Um, there's, there's a lot of different things you can do that are involved with uh, just the hobby of shooting black powder, shooting flint locks, muzzle, traditional muzzle loading. So this horn here, um, I'll throw up some images of it when it was more rough than this. I don't have any, 
I didn't take any images when it was uh, rough and raw as when I first got it. When I first got this, it was untouched as far as a cap off of a, a bison. It uh, was very rough, it had a lot of the scale on it. A friend of mine uh, butchers bison for some of the native tribes up here and he gets access to a lot of these uh, bison caps and he gave me one to use and I um, with an idea and an outline of of what a traditional bison horn during the fur trade or the the, uh, the frontier years would look like uh, typically just a pine wood or a cotton wood any of the soft woods up here cap uh, pine or fur and that's what I used up here some brass rivets and uh, it was a learning process the hardest part for me was uh, definitely getting this up here uh, inserted and uh, just matched properly. I, I, I didn't do the, the steam fit or the, uh, the heat treat where you would make the horn perfectly round and then insert uh, a conical piece of wood and cut it flush. I actually scribed the wood, as you can see here it's not perfectly round. I scribed the wood to the horn, so I left the horn natural and then adjusted the wood to the horn. Overall it took more time, more work. I was able to insert it and uh, finished it with beeswax. Uh, it took a lot of sanding, a lot of filing. Um, the biggest thing was down here, you know, I wanted an octagon on there so I uh, filed in some octagon flats. You can see them there. That took quite a bit of work. Also filed in a, uh, a lanyard loop right there filed and sanded down the spout here and then we did a taper ream on the on the spout so that the, it would fit the taper of a finial. So there you go, that's my first handmade horn. Um, it was definitely a fun project and it should hold quite a bit of powder. It's a, it's a fairly large diameter horn. For now I've just got this basically boot leather, um, boot laces leather for a strap until I can come up with something different, find another strap in the future, uh, maybe jute strap or a little bit thicker leather strap to uh, secure it. We'll go through the possibles bag here. This is from uh, blackpowderbags.com. Uh, Leatherman, he makes really good bags. They're all handmade by him. When you order his bags, you have two choices. You can get either a jute strap or a leather strap for your shoulder strap here. And I chose to go with uh, a leather strap for my bag. The image here you see is called the Hunter's Star. It was a uh, good luck for hunters back in the 17th, 18th century. And my dad actually has one in his Possible's bag, so I grew up used to seeing a Hunter's Star on a Possible's bag, and I figured why not. I chose and spent the extra 20 bucks or whatever it was to have a Hunter's Star on the outside of my pouch. The design you see here is called a beaver tail. It's a beaver tail flap. And sometimes you'll see a little lead weight sewn into the leather just to keep the pouch down. Right here off on the side you'll see a, a pan brush and a vent pick. Just a couple of little maintenance items for cleaning your pan. And again the pick for cleaning out the, the vent hole, the touch hole, where the ignition of the pan will go into the main charge of the rifle or fowler. Up here you see a short starter. Now I didn't have to get one of these but I have already seen in the short time that I've been out shooting flintlocks more routinely than in the past, I've already seen one uh, ramrod get heavily damaged uh, just due to trying to force a ball down the muzzle in the loading process. Because it can be pretty tight depending on your, your ball and patch combination, temperature, uh, how much fouling's in the rifle. It can be kind of difficult to get that ball started with a patch. And uh, you just, in order to save your rod's life, you can use a uh, short starter to really send that ball home and uh, get it started. If you've seen some of the black powder videos we've done recently, uh, you've seen some of them using short starters, other guys using basically just the butt of a knife to start a, uh, a ball in the muzzle end of their rifle. Uh, so I do like having a short starter and uh, so there you go, There's what, that's what that is. I'll try it out, I'll see how I like using it. Sewn up here, you'll see a. this is a patch knife. These are actually handmade in the USA. What this would be for is to cut a section of patch if I'm using strips or squares of patch material when loading my rifle. Um, I can use this to cut the patch to shape, cut it to size, and then seat and set the ball. Getting into the bag, there's 
several pockets. You've got uh, this exterior pocket here, which uh, this is just a section of patch material I found on the range one day. Happened to hold on to it. I don't, I'll have to mic it to know exactly what thickness it is to know if I can actually use it or not. But for now it's out in this pocket here. This will probably uh, be a pocket I either keep some ball in or some patch material. For now I've got all my patch and uh, ball in a separate location. It's just I haven't fully stocked or loaded the bag yet. But uh, until I know the exact load I'm going to use, I've got this measure here. Again, this is a lot of these items you'll see these individual loose items are from Track of the Wolf. So this is a brass adjustable uh, measure, powder measure. You can see here it goes all the way down to five grains. Yeah, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, all the way up to one twenty. So five grains to one hundred and twenty grains, uh, and it has five grain increments all the way up it. So ten grains. 120 and on this side it's five grains to 120 and the way this works you can slide this in or out tighten this brass here and then this slides off to the side you've got your measure you fill this up and you charge your rifle with the appropriate load so there's a powder measure this is a spare finial this is actually the finial that came with the uh, the older English style horn there tool pouch brass oil vial I can use this to keep an extra little bit of oil on hand if I do if I'm out for an extended period of time or I want to clean my rifle and then oil it back up make sure it's properly treated so I opened the tool pouch up here and dumped all its contents out so you could see what what was kept inside of it uh, up here you've got three flint pockets each one of these carries an additional flint as well as a small piece of leather that I would place the flint in when it's sitting in the jaws and going through some of the contents here that I keep in this tool pouch again this tool pouch is from the same guy that makes these bags here uh, black powder bags I carry some spare cleaning patches screwdriver for opening the jaws on the cock there to insert flints and uh, remove flints as well as taking the lock off the rifle. Hand forged piece of steel and it also allows you if you wish to uh, to reshape a flint just by treating it almost like that flint hammer that you see over there, a uh, napping hammer, we'll get to that. But uh, if I wish to I could I could just carry this and uh, not the brass hammer there. This is indeed a, it's a napping hammer uh, designed to shape and reshape, kind of return a flint to a sharper edge uh, and just give me a better spark. I uh, picked this up off of Track of the Wolf as well as I think all these little tools here. Little brass funnel here. I can use this to fill the horns with powder or when I go to clean my rifle I could uh, use this to just direct a better stream of water while pouring some water down the muzzle so it doesn't hurt to have a little brass funnel around. This is a cleaning jag for a 54 caliber. This is what I put the patches on when I'm cleaning and swabbing out the bore. This is a breech scraper 54 caliber. I would thread this on to the ramrod. The breech end of these rifles is flat, so this will go down there and scrape out a lot of that black powder residue that kind of builds up and, and can cake into the corners and that flat breech end over time. So again, I'll just insert this all the way back to the breech, twist it, scrape it out, and then pull it out and then go about cleaning the rifle. This worm here is designed for removing a a stuck patch or a patch that uh, somehow came off while you were cleaning and it's somewhere in the bore so you put this on the end of your rod push it down there twist it until you've gathered the patch up on the hook and it it would work its way up the corkscrew and then just pull the patch out of the bore then you've got a ball puller all the older gentlemen who've been doing this for quite some time have already told me uh, there will come a day where you introduce a ball into your rifle before you introduce powder in which case you'll have to remove the ball then there's the other circumstance where you may be out hunting all day you haven't seen anything you haven't had an opportunity to shoot your rifle and you don't want to discharge the powder in it or fire the rifle you would insert this ball puller into the muzzle attached to your rod press it into the lead ball that's loaded in there screw it in and then pull the ball out of the rifle. So that's pretty much it for the contents of the tool pouch. A few other items that I was working on last summer were individual dose powder measures. 
so once I figure out what the final load is going to be for my particular rifle, I will then adjust one of these here to be my single dose loader. So for example, if the final load for my rifle is let's say 65 or 70 grains, 75 grains, whatever it might be, I will uh, fill these with powder and I'll adjust it and figure out ex exactly where the horn needs to be uh, cut and finished to in order to get it to where when it's full to a certain line I can mark a line inside or have it flush on the top. It's the appropriate load for my rifle. Uh, and at that point I will have uh, an individual horn for my main charge. In which case I'll attach that horn to either my my bag or the powder horn. So I've been working on a couple of different designs and different uh, loads here. All of these horns uh, came from tines off of deer that I harvested myself over the years. So they were all smaller bucks. I just cut the antlers up and uh, drilled them out and started coming up with some designs for powder measures. These are some of my earliest attempts at working with the horn material with files and sandpaper, trying to get octagon shapes out of it and polishing flats. And definitely a learning curve to it. Fun nevertheless. And for you guys that are big knife lovers out there, there are some cool knives that surround this era and this hobby itself and one of the gentlemen that I mentioned earlier the guy that actually got me the uh, the cap there for that bison horn he does a lot of butchering butchers hogs every year he butchers several bison a year uh, for the native tribes he's very knowledgeable when it comes to what works and uh, everything he does is very period correct and he's just a wealth of information and a resource of material and one of the things he turned me on to were these knives. Now I'd seen them before because my dad actually had a Green River knife. He had the big Skinner knife. I think it had the, the more of a belly to it. Um, and here's two examples of the Green River series. These are made by Russell. They're made in the USA and I believe they're made in the same building or on the same block that the original Dexter Russell knives were made in years ago during the trade era. Uh, the blade design is very traditional from the 17th 18th centuries. They're a beechwood handle, brass rivets, and I believe it's 1095E steel, so it, it will it will rust. It's not stainless, but it's extremely hard, very sharp, and just holds an amazing edge. He actually shared with me that he's used his version of this blade, the 6-inch Dexter Russell, the Butcher, on uh, multiple bison in one season. Amazing knife. Also, if you're able to use a flint and steel very well to make sparks, uh, you can use the back edge of this blade, and it will produce a really good spark. Uh, if you have a tinder kit and want to start a fire with one. This is the four and a half, I believe, or the five inch hunter blade. It's got more of a little checkered grip to it, you can see there. Again, all they're all full tang, and again, 1095, but they're not spendy. That's the coolest thing about these blades, is all of them are under 20 bucks. You have to finish the handles yourself. They come kind of just raw beech wood. So what I've done over the last several months is every once in a while, I'll buff some linseed oil into these and then again I made some fix and wax out of uh, coconut oil and shea butter and mink oil and I've buffed that into these as well with some pine oil. So that's why they actually have a nice finish on them at this point is I've just been buffing it into them just to preserve the wood. Thanks for watching and take it apart. If you get a chance check out some of the full length flip lock shooting videos we've put out. There should be three of them up there for you. I got a flip lock playlist going. Alright, thanks for watching.